Hello and thank you for watching this presentation by the American Iron Society. Please support the organization by becoming a member. Go to irises.org and click on join. Thank you. Yeah, I've been growing iris in containers for, for quite a long time. Um, I kind of started uh, from Don Spoon. I went up to Winterberry Gardens uh, one time with the Fredericksburg Area Iris Society and uh, Don had a lot of iris in, in containers. And I thought, well, you know what? If Don can grow them in containers, I can grow them in containers. Um, and, and for the most part, um, I've grown them in containers because I needed garden space. Uh, I had basically like a, a quarter acre lot in Virginia um, and that doesn't afford you much space for, for iris when you, you grow 250 to 300. Um, so you, that, that picture that you see there, that's the retaining wall for the pool. And there's over 25 iris in that, in that row right there alone. And as you can see, they've, uh, they've bloomed pretty well. Um, most of the stuff that I do grow, I do grow in the black plastic pots the nursery pots, but I've got uh, some other things also. Um, basically the topics for discussion, uh, why grow iris in containers? Will iris bloom in containers? Types and sizes of containers to use, soil for use in containers, uh, care of the container grown iris, hardiness zone concerns, pros and cons of growing iris in containers, and exhibiting container grown iris. Um, there's a, there's a, just a, so much to talk about here. And if you've got questions, please, uh, please you know, either chat them up or, or ask them. Um, and as we were getting, getting ready and people were coming on, uh, folks were talking about different things and, and some people don't grow or haven't grown any iris in containers up to this point. And other people, uh, my understanding is that's, that's the only way they grow them. Um, and they will definitely grow well in containers. Um, why grow iris in containers? Uh, mainly because for me anyway, most of the time it was because I didn't have any space left in the garden. Um, and if you see that uh, garden bed up on the right, that's one that I just built down here in South Carolina and it's obviously full. Uh, so I still have container iris around the house. Um, you need it, you need it, just need a temporary holding place. Um, and sometimes the holding place may be for um, a short period of time, maybe a month or two until you get a bed ready. But in other cases, and, and a lot of times for me, it's been, you know, a year or two and, and you're gonna see some some uh, pictures later on that it's been over a couple of years. Um, there's, other, there's other times where you wanna showcase your iris. And down here on the end of the pool down here, uh, that's a nice big pot and that's got four different iris in it. Um, this, this one here, this is Ico Ico, that's a, a Louisiana. Um, that really bloomed out nice for me. Uh, this year and even last year, um, but uh, you know sometimes you just want to showcase your iris, um, and so there's different 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 ways to do that. Um, some people may just be container gardeners. Um, that's that's a a, a lot of people uh, just like growing flowers in containers. Um, they can they can move them around, do whatever you know, move them to different places depending on when they're blooming and and, and stuff. Um, you may want to bring your containers indoors to enjoy the bloom. Um, one of the things that that comes to mind when I talk about that is uh, four or six bulletins ago, there was an article in the bulletin about cold hours. And iris need cold hours, uh, so if you bring your iris indoors, or, or, or you know maybe into a, a, a warmer area, or keep them in the garage over the winter or something like that, 
they may not experience the cold hour, cold hours that that particular iris needs. So keep that in mind when you're moving them around. Um, you may want to enter an iris in a container uh, in a show, and that's something that's that's new as of the new judge's handbook. And we'll touch on iris in shows uh, at the end of the program. You may be trading or selling or, or bringing your iris to an event. Um, it's, it's, um, it's a good way to, to sell an iris. Um, a nursery that I was uh, friends with up in, in Virginia, um, I, I gave them 100 iris in, in one gallon pots one year um, and uh, from the Fredericksburg Area Iris Society. And basically the, the, uh, the folks there said, if it's got a bloom on it, we can sell it. Um, and, and they sold them. Uh, so it's nice to, to do that. And if you're giving a, a container, if you're, you wanna give it as a gift, it's also pretty special if it's got a, if it's got a bloom on it. Um, so it's, it's, uh, that's kind of, kind of neat. Will iris bloom in containers? You betcha. They'll definitely bloom in containers and they, they can bloom very well. Uh, but the container size will definitely determine the showiness of iris. Um, I, I've had a lot of iris in, in three gallon pots. I do most of them that, that, I, that I want to um, nurture pretty well in three gallon pots. I've, I've done a lot of iris in one gallon pots and they will bloom in one gallon pots, uh, but you'll, you'll normally only get like a year bloom out of the one gallon pots and then they start to get crowded. Uh, the three gallon pots, you can get a couple of years out of most of the time. Uh, so the size, of the, the size of the container will determine how many years you might get bloom. Um, it will also determine what the growth height is. Um, the smaller pots obviously kind of restrict the, the growth um, to a certain degree. And so they'll be, they'll be a little bit smaller. Uh, and the other thing that'll happen is with, especially with the smaller pots, you see that pot there on the right? Well, they're trying to escape and they will definitely break open a plastic pot uh, when they get, get crowded. Um, I can tell you that <laughs> That, that iris there has been in that pot for a few years. Um, when, I, when, when I was getting ready to leave Virginia, a couple, of, a couple of years ahead of when I was leaving Virginia, I knew that we were moving. And so a lot of the newer iris and a lot of the iris that I had in pots, I, I, newer iris I put in pots to, so it's easier to move them down here to South Carolina and the, the other ones in some of the smaller pots. I just left them there and they will survive. They'll just get really crowded and really small. Um, but when I got them down here, then I worked on uh, getting, them, getting them spread out and getting them into the, the iris bed. Um, uh, yes. A couple questions. One is sure. when you're talking about um, um, cold, uh, requiring cold hours for iris, uh, the question is how cold? There, um, you, they, you'd have to go back to the bulletin. Um, and if you're, if you're not a, a member of the American Irish Society, then you, you won't have the bulletin. But um, the, the bulletin talks about different iris. Um, I think if I remember the numbers, I would say that 200 hour, 2,000 hours, I mean, is, is, a, good, is a good number. I, I believe when I was in Virginia, the Virginia area, there was a whole chart, just like the, just like the uh, um, chart of the uh, hardiness zones. There was a whole chart in the, in the article. Um, I believe in the Virginia area, I was over 2000 cold hours. Um, and after I read the article, I moved, you know, I moved down here and then I read the article and I looked at the chart and, and thought to myself, uh-oh, because I'm now down in the thousand hour range. So I don't know um, how good some of my bearded iris that like the cold a little bit better will do down here. They seem to be doing well. 
Now, obviously, some of the other warmer climate iris uh, will will survive. Um, um, it's it, it it really you you have to look at that cold hours chart, and I think you can actually find a cold hours chart online, not just in that article, because I think that chart was pulled from a, a chart online. And there's a, a comment from Chuck Chapman. Uh, who says about 600 hours at 40 degrees Fahrenheit? Yeah, I think 40 degrees Fahrenheit is the is the um, determining temperature for for the cold hours. Um, some of them, you know, some of them like a little bit more, um, but but cold hours can be can be an issue with with uh, certain iris. Okay. Um, anything else, Gary? Uh, one other question, which you may, maybe you'll be covering this a little bit later. Uh, will containers help control the spread of bacterial rot? I've, I've not had, had um, a lot of rot issues in, in my container iris. Uh, I'm not sure why. I'm, I'm, I've made an assumption that because they drain a whole lot better uh, and they don't hold moisture like soil will hold them hold moisture if you get a lot of rains. Um, I think they just tend to dry and not hold moisture. So I've not had um, rot problems. Um, and the other thing that, that I found with uh, speaking in, in that area, um, leaf spot. I found that leaf spot is reduced and I believe it's because you don't have the ground around the fans to splash the um, bacteria or whatever up onto the up onto the leaves, um, but I've I've have seen um, a definite reduction in leaf spot with uh, container grown iris. Good. And, uh, um, yeah, just a comment from Howie Dash. He says I've had irises rot in pots, but it is rare. Yeah, I I I might have had one or two issues. Um, but, but very, very seldom in pots. And again, I think it's, I think it's just because they drain uh, really well. Um, and, and I say that we're gonna talk about reservoirs later on, but, but for the most part, they, they drain pretty well. Okay. Um, nursery pots, uh, we're gonna talk about sizes and con uh, of the containers to use. Uh, nursery pots from one to five gallon size. Um, can be used, um, and I said temporarily, but uh, you know, normally a, a lot of people uh, obviously don't use them temporarily, they use them more permanently. Um, so I probably misspoke there. Um, I don't know, my pig likes to get into pictures. You all see that? I don't know where he comes from. Um, large, uh, larger decorative pots and containers should be used for display if you're, if you're looking to actually be showy with them. Uh, reservoirs are recommended for use with most pots. Um, and and the, the, the pots that you saw on the, um, the wall, retaining wall, um, most of those were black pots and they don't have reservoirs. Um, so there's, there's an issue with, with watering, but if you, can, if you can get a little reservoir underneath the pot or get a pot that has a reservoir in the bottom of it, that, that gives you just a little bit of extra moisture holding um, down at the bottom of the pot. And, and the roots will definitely migrate their way down there. They'll, they'll go deep in that pot. Um, contain wide containers. If you're looking for a nice display, um, and we talk about if you're looking for a, a nice display of iris, you can plant them in a triangle. And as they spread over the years, you'll end up with a nice clump. Well, you can do the same thing in a pot. Um, you know, you can, you can, you know, you need to program out. Um, so two or three years down the road, you've got your nice clump. But with a with a wide container, you can really get a a nice clump. And and a lot of times, you can push an extra year out of it if you get a big enough one. Um, begonia bags and and jelly jars. Um, that's kind of interesting because. Begonia bags are these plastic bags that, that you see uh, begonias tucked into, okay? 
and you can hang them on something. Um, I call them begonia bags. There's other things that they put in there, but you can use strawberry jars. And this picture of this iris tectorum here, um, I've put that in a begonia bag and, and hung it on a, a six by six post in the yard. And it looks like orchids in bloom. It's just gorgeous. Um, and containers for, containers for exhibition should be manageable. Um, you don't want a big, huge pot. Uh, you don't want to take a big, huge pot to a, to a show. Uh, it's just a lot of work to handle it for one thing. Uh, you, you really want to be, you want to be three gallon or less, I think, if you're, if you're taking it to a show. Um, and I've gone through here, I've got some pictures here. Um, now this little pot right here, uh, obviously these couple of pots here are definitely smaller than one gallon, but I put iris rhizomes in those because I wanted to share them with a local garden club down here in South Carolina. And, and I didn't want to use a bigger pot because they're just going to take these and they're going to go ahead and pop them out of there and plant them dirt and all in, in their gardens. So this was a good way to, to transfer um, some iris rhizomes to some of the garden club people um, and, and not have them sit out for an extended period of time. I could keep them, keep them fresh and keep, you know, get the roots growing and stuff like that. Um, you see that there's some three gallon pots here. Uh, there's a gallon pot here. Um, that iris tectorum that you saw in the previous picture, that's it right there a few days ago. Just, you know, dies off over the winter. Just clip it back in the spring and uh, it'll come back. And of course, this is a larger decorative pot. This is again, Ico Ico um, blooms. I mean, you look at the number of bloom stocks that are in that. It's, it did very, very well, very well. Um, reservoirs. Now this is, this is a really big pot. <laughs> the picture that you see is a hole that I drilled in the side of the pot. Now, a lot of these pots, you'll look at the bottom down here and it'll say drill here for drainage, okay? Well, if you want a little bit of a reservoir, don't drill in the bottom. Drill your holes and this, this pot has three holes in it uh, around, around the outside edge, but I've got about an inch reservoir in there. So it's gonna hold a little bit of water. Um, so that's a way if you're, if you're buying some of these pots, and you want to you want to get a little bit of reservoir? Don't drill that hole in the bottom. Drill it in the side. And again, the wide containers provide you with nice large clumps. Um, I think that is frozen fire, gorgeous iris. Uh, but and look how full that is. Now, this is the th third year in that pot. Okay. So the bloom stalks are much shorter, but they're still the, the flower size and the, and the coloring is, is right on the money. It's just a little bit shorter. There's a jelly jar. If you took, if you took uh, Iris Tectorum or, or Alba or one of the others, um, for some reason that seems to do good in, in, in containers like this, but if you put, put them around the edge, I mean, it, it would just give you a beautiful display. Uh, of iris. And this can, uh, the reason I showed this container I talked about should be manageable. Um, this one here is a little bit of a heavy pot. It's, it's maybe a little bit bigger than a three gallon. It, it would be movable and, and uh, to, to bring to a show, but it's probably on the, on the large size. Uh, the iris looks great in it, okay. Um, but it, it's probably on the larger, heavier size as far as trying to, trying to get it to a show. Um, soil. Um, everybody's got their own little mix for soil. Um, they, they'll do this, they'll do that, they'll put this in it, put that in it. Um, but the key really is to have some good organic, well-drained soil. Um, that's that that gets you gets you a, a nice um, opportunity to get iris to bloom in pots. 
uh, and a good balance of nutrients is, is a must for the containers. Now, I, I, my, my mix includes, I use this stay green flower and vegetable uh, soil as, as a base. Um, I do not, and I have done it before and I've shied away from it. Uh, some people may use it, and, and, but I shied away from it, the, the moisture controlled soils. Um, I just wasn't happy with the way they perform. But I use this, I use composted manure, I use peat moss, alfalfa meal, uh, green sand. And green sand is not a sand, it's a mineral additive. It looks like sand, but it's a mineral additive. Rock phosphate, bone meal, ironite. I use a general 101010 10 fertilizer when I make up my, my soils. Uh, lime, if, if I need to adjust the pH a little bit, uh, to raise it a little bit, um, but for some iris, I, I definitely wouldn't use lime. Uh, pulverized eggshells. I take, I take eggshells and I rinse them after we, you know, cook them. I rinse the eggshells out a little bit and I let them dry. And I take a coffee bean grinder and I grind up the eggshells. It basically pulverizes them. And then I just add that into my soil mix. Eggshells have got a lot of minerals in them. Coffee grounds, I use coffee grounds. Now we use the uh, K cups, the cured K cups, um, but I open every one of those up and dump it in a little bowl and, and I dump that into my, my soil mix. Um, it's it, good organics. And you know anything, I mean, anything else you prefer any, any way you wanna make your soil mix, but that's, that's kind of what I do in the, the, uh, the, the garden and vegetable soil um, makes up uh, half to maybe two thirds of the base. Uh, the rest of it is peat moss and the, and the uh, uh, compost and manure. And then of course, everything else that's in there is, is really just light amendments. It's not, it's not and sometimes I put some topsoil in there. Um, when, you're, when you're putting the soil in the containers, fill them to the top. Um, you're probably going to want to leave about a half inch for watering, uh, but you're going to find that over, if you, if you keep them in pots for, for a couple of years, you're going to find that soil is going to settle way down. Um, you'd be surprised as how much it, it actually settles. Uh, you, you, you don't really realize it in the garden, but when you start putting it in pots, you, you pick up on it pretty quick. And then, like I, like I said earlier, just adjust your pH for the various types of iris that you're, that you're growing. Uh, any questions, Gary? Yeah, one or, one or two. Um, one is how well do grow bags or cloth pots work and do they drain too well? Um, when you're talking about grow bags, um, what, what are you talking about in particular? Uh, well, I know uh, some company. There are a couple companies that sell uh, uh, fabric pots or uh, cloth. Oh, okay. Of fabric. Um, I have I have not used any fabric pots. The the begonia bags that I was talking about those are plastic. Um, so basically, um, they they will drain a little bit if you, especially if you put a small hole in the bottom. But I didn't I didn't put a hole in mine. I let it hold the water. And that and Tectorum seems to to like that, um, but I've not used any fabric um, or even any um, uh, fiber fiber type pots where you have that fiber base film. I've not used any pots like that. Okay, um, and then an, uh, another little uh, tip about uh, the eggshells. Um, uh, Robin Allen says that any food processor works great for eggshells. They also yep. help discourage slugs if you sprinkle them on top of the soil. Yes, yeah, because they're sharp. The edges are the edges are sharp. Um, but yeah, I mean, don't don't waste the eggshells. And in fact, uh, if you if you put eggshells in a uh, uh, like a gallon jug of water, um, they'll leach out the minerals, and you can use it to water houseplants and things like that with it. Um, it may, you need to keep an eye on it because it may get a little funky after a while. Okay. But uh, egg eggshells are really good, and you don't necessarily have to pulverize them really, really small. 
like like you said, if you if you leave them a little coarser, they'll uh, they'll help you with uh, some critters and stuff. Okay. And then uh, another question: What do you use to adjust pH to be more acid? I would I would use like the um, um, sulfur type uh, things. Now the other thing too is you have to remember that peat moss normally has a lower pH to it. Uh, so you know, I wouldn't necessarily go overboard with the peat moss. I add it just because I want the organics and it, it tends to help hold moisture also. But um, I would use, you know, one of, the, one of the garden chemicals that you can get at Lowe's or, or Home Depot or whatever to, to lower pH. <coughs> okay. Excuse me. Um, and then a uh, comment from Bonita um, says, um, note on garden versus potting soil, watch the nitrogen level of purchased soils. Uh, some will have very high nitrogen, which will cause you problems. Yes, yeah, you need to be careful with that. And some of the soils that I get, uh, I can't remember, I think this stay green has a, a little bit of fertilizer in it, but it's, but it's not much. And that's another reason why I only use 10-10-10 um, when I'm adding fertilizer in, uh, I don't use anything that's got high nitrogen um, at all. Just, just be real. Always, I mean, even even with iris in the ground, be real careful with high nitrogen. Yeah, um, and I, I think another comment uh, comment uh, which is worth uh, talking about is using garden soil. Uh, watch that because of compaction in pots. Uh, with garden soil, air can't get in. They don't drain as well. No, <clears throat> that's why I mix up when I when I mix my soil up, and I use this for my flower beds and for my pots. I use the use the same thing, but when I when I put it together, I've got a like a, a wheelbarrow, okay, and I'll dump I'll dump the components into the wheelbarrow, and I'll go around it by four or five times with a shovel, mixing all those components over and adding water to it because the, for one thing, the peat moss is always very dry when you get it. Um, and so when I'm, when I'm mixing that all up, I'll add water to it as I'm going around to get it to a certain moisture content. Um, a, a, an interesting story, cute little story. Um, I, I, I like the alfalfa meal, but a few years ago, I couldn't get the alfalfa meal, so I ended up um, getting alfalfa pellets. And so I mixed up my soil mix in my wheelbarrow. And then normally when I mix it up, I let it set overnight so that all the moisture kind of you know soaks into everything. I got up the next day and I looked at it. <clears throat> and if, uh, if you know what goose poop looks like, well, that's what swelled up alfalfa pellets look like. And I'm, I looked down at my wheelbarrow and I thought there must have been a herd of goose in the flock of geese in that, in that wheelbarrow because it was just all those little pellets were all swelled up. So I had to go back around through it and, and uh, mix it all up again to mix all that, all that uh, organics from the uh, uh, alfalfa pellets in. But um, I like using the alfalfa meal. And if you can't find the meal, the pellets will work just know that you probably need to mix it a second time. And I always, <clears throat> when I mix my soil up, like I said, it, it, you, you really need to mix it up good and add water to it as you're mixing it. It's um, just, you don't wanna get it soaked, but the peat moss is dry and some of the other things can be a little bit dry. So you wanna get, get that moisture going in there, especially so that when you go to plant, you've got some moisture in that soil already. Okay. Um, good? No. Uh, okay. one, uh, one other question. Does anyone put a layer of sand on the top to reduce rot and leaf spot? I, I don't. Um, and like I said earlier, I, I have found with the pots um, that leaf spot is minimized. And again, I think it's just because you don't get the splash from, from the adjacent soil that you normally would in a, in a garden. Okay, um, and just a couple of comments. One is if you're using alfalfa pellets, be sure and get the kind without salt added. 
and um, a comment about coffee grounds uh, can have nitrogen for use in compost. They're considered a green material due to their nitrogen content, uh, something to consider when adding them with granulated fertilizer. Yes. And then comments about uh, uh, drying eggshells in the oven, which hopefully will kill salmonella if that's a, uh, an issue. Well, I I rinse I rinse mine in the in the sink under the faucet, and then I let them dry really well. Um, I let them dry really well before I pulverize them. You you really need to do that if you want to get them pulverized halfway decent, because if you do it while they're still damp, you're going to have a mess. So the, I I let mine dry out anyway. And then a question: uh, Do you have experience with um, crushed pine bark with Osmocote? So nursery nurserymen are using that. No, as a as a uh, as a top dressing on the pots. Mm -hmm. it's that, yeah, I think so. That's what um, I think. That's what Eileen Hollander, if you want to uh, clarify that, I think that's what she's asking. No, actually, in our area, uh, nurserymen are going to totally use crushed pine bark oh. and throw in some osmocote at low concentrations, but no other soil, no potting soil, no uh, topsoil, just that. And I was wondering if you had any experience doing that with the irises. No, I've not, I've not heard of that. That sounds kind of interesting though. Hmm. Now, are they, are they using it for irises or are they using it for they're uh, using it for everything. Everything? <laughs> yeah, it's uh. easy to get the uh, crushed, um, you know, pine bark. And I mean, they're using it for trees, shrubs, every, potting, uh, you know, small plants, everything. Huh. Hmm. I have to keep that in mind. Interesting. Something to try. Okay. Okay. Um, care of uh, container uh, grown iris. Um, as, as some of you who grow iris know, and those of you who don't, uh, water, water, water. The soil dries out really quickly in a pot. Um, even, even with a reservoir, the soil dries out quickly in a pot. And especially if, you, if you're using the black nursery pots. Because uh, in, in, um, the, the pots that you saw in my, my row of pots on the retaining wall, um, those iris stay there year round. They stay there during the summer. They stay there during the winter. I don't do anything special to them. I just, I clean them up when the, when you get dead leaves and stuff, I clean them up, you know, snap off the bloom stalks and things like that. Uh, but they stay out there year round and during the summer, um, they get sun and the, the black plastic pots, uh, they will, they will dry really quickly. You have to water them uh, basically every single day. Um, so it's, it's, um, it's, it's something that you have to keep up with. Um, and they like full sun. Now, um, somebody was talking earlier about, uh, I think Pacific Coast Iris, uh, and she was moving them around just so that they didn't get beat up by the sun. So if you've got, if you've got some Iris that, that, tend to be a little bit more tender um, <clears throat> and, and do need to be kept out of the sun a little bit. Uh, if you've got it in a pot, you can put it wherever you want it. Um, you can move it around and, and stuff. <clears throat> um, I, I feed my iris routinely. Um, we're gonna, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about that on the next slide, but I, I feed my iris routinely whether they're in pots or not. Um, we, I, <laughs> I basically tell the story, you know, I don't miss a meal. Um, plants, are, plants are feeding pretty much all the time. Um, and so, you know, I, I routinely feed them. <clears throat> At least once, once a month, they get a, they get a feeding. Um, and then sometimes more than that. Um, the other nice thing about growing pots is, especially if you want to uh, display them, 
is you can basically rotate the pot. And if, you, if you're in an area where the sun is always off to one side and, and the, the flowers, the bloom stalks and everything are leaning one way, well, turn it around and, and you know, just turn it a little bit, you know, every, every week or so, and it'll help keep things growing up straight. Um, like I was saying, that my, my containers, um, I leave them outside uh, year round. Uh, they get snowed on, they get plenty of sun, they get rain, um, they, do, they do fine. Now, in some of the more northern regions, um, you, may, you may need to mulch around uh, the pots a little bit. I, I'm, I grew iris in Virginia, so we would, we would get cold, uh, we would get snow, you know, we get down and, you know, every now and then we would get down into close to the single digits. Um, but for the most part, you know, we'd be in the 20s and 30s during the winter, during the real cold part of the winter. Uh, but, you know, I, I had no problem with them. Um, iris are pretty tough. Uh, they, they winter pretty well, at least the bearded iris. Um, and even, even some of the other ones that I've had, the Louisianas and stuff, they seem to be doing pretty good. Um, during the winter months, I still water if, if needed. You know, if we're not getting any rain or we're not getting a little bit of snow on top, um, it's good to, to give them a little bit of water. Um, again, I, I already talked about the leaf spot. I, I leaf spot and, and um, rot. Even, even iris borer, Seems to, and I, so, I know some people out west don't have a borer problem, but um, even the iris borer seems to be less of a problem in, in potted iris. Um, I, again, I removed the bloom stalks and the old leaves as you normally would in your garden, and you know they they uh, they do really well. Okay, let's talk about feeding. There's a couple of uh, uh, comments and questions. One is, sure. what, U what USDA climate zone are you in? Right now, I'm in eight. Okay. And I, uh, was, I was in uh, six to seven up in Virginia. Yeah. Um, and uh, then Chuck Chapman says, in colder climates, pots can freeze solid. So you need to protect the pots over winter. Um, I completely agree with that. Our ground is frozen solid. And any pots you have out, will be completely frozen solid in the winter here. And so you, you cannot leave them out. Um, some, may, some irises may live through it, but uh, especially if you have here, if you have um, uh, pots, those pots will freeze solid. And yes. if you've got ceramic or, or clay pots, it will totally break those pots apart. Uh, yes. Freeze all things. So you'll, you'll destroy your pots. Uh, during the winter if they are uh, uh, ceramic pots or, or pottery, that sort of thing. Uh, so you do have to protect them. Um, and I, I uh, would just caution people in northern climates to be sure you do that. Um, either mulch all the way to the top of the pot with a, a good mulch or bury them, or I have a, um, an unheated um, back garage that I put them in, it, it's cold, but it doesn't, um, you don't get the, the freeze and thaw and, and they, they do fine, they don't freeze solid. Yeah. Uh, so something like that. Um, and then let's see, I think um, uh, also in, in watering, it says if the ground freezes and then you get rain and then the water freezes, uh, the ice can be a problem. So you can, you can damage uh, the irises by the uh, the ice on them. Um, so I think that's that's it. Okay. Yeah, in the in the northern climates, again, we we got cold and we got snow. I mean, you know, it, <clears throat> um, but you know, you get up get up further north, and I would totally. I mean, the frost line in Virginia is real shallow. Uh, it's it's not deep at all. But <clears throat> I'm originally from Western Massachusetts, and you know. The Frost line up there can can go pretty deep, uh, so if you got them if you got them above ground, you need to you need to protect them in some way. Mm -hmm. <clears throat>
Anyway, um, I, I said I was going to talk about feeding routinely. Um, and I always kind of talk about this. I don't know if any of, any of you that are listening know much about Jerry Baker, but Jerry Baker years ago, this is, I mean, this is 20, 20 years ago, probably. I got, I got a stack of these little books and, and one of them was on shrubs and one of them was on lawns and one of them was on roses and one of them was on this and that, none of them on iris. But anyway, and this was the, the Baker's Dozen little book. And he's got all these home remedies for, for this and that and the other thing, okay? And of course you see right there, it says beer, your favorite yards or your yard's favorite brew. Um, well, if you, if you look over on the, on the right-hand side over here, the number one says a can of beer, a cup of ammonia, an ounce of dishwashing soap, three tablespoons of instant tea mix. That's one of the things. Now this is for vegetables, but I, I, I use his um, theories, let me, let me call it that way, or his, his practices to a certain degree. Um, and I use, I have a cup sprayer that says 26 gallons is, is the cup sprayer. If I'm using the cup sprayer, basically, uh, and, I, and I spray my um, potted iris as well as the, as the ones that are not in pots, but I normally use like a, oops, what do I do here? Let me go back. I usually use a can of beer in that cup sprayer. And I, uh, miracle Grow has three basic fertilizer mixes the soluble ones. They have the regular, which is a little bit higher in nitrogen. They have a bloom buster, and then they have a tomato. And the tomato is more level. The bloom buster is, the center number is higher. <clears throat> I rotate between those. Uh, and basically it says a tablespoon of, of um, miracle Grow per gallon of water. Well, I have a 26 cups or 26 gallon sprayer when the, but you know, um, and so what I do is I put like four or five tablespoons in. So it's a very weak mix and I alternate. One time when I feed, I use one of them. The next time when I feed, I use another one. The next time when I feed, I use the other one. But I always use a can of beer. Taste the beer first. Do not give your iris bad beer. Can of beer, dishwashing soap, instant iced tea mix, and the miracle Grow. Um, and I spray my plants with that now. A lot of times I will water the um, iris in pots or in containers with a watering can, two gallon watering can. Uh, in that case, I just pretty much rotate the uh, miracle grows. But I always, I always um, routinely feed uh, my iris and I don't feed them the same thing every time. Um, and they seem to like it. Um, they seem to do well. I've been, I've been real happy with, with that. Uh, I know there's a lot of people that have, have their own uh, fertilizer program, if you will. Uh, but this is, this is what I do. And it seems to work very well for the potted iris. Um, Doug, there's a, uh, just a clarification. Uh, Robin Allen says, you put the miracle grow in with the beer tea mix. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, the cups, the cup sprayer. It's it's just a a, a, a little um, cup sprayer. Basically, you, you fill it with water. You put it on the end of your hose, okay? But there's a line that says 26 gallons. And when you fill the fluid up in there, I put I put the beer in and the dishwashing soap and the instant iced tea and the Miracle Grow and fill the rest of it up with water to the 26 gallon line. And then when you turn it on, basically, it's just spraying out all that all that um, um, liquid that you have in there. So when it gets, when it gets done, it's basically, you know, used up 26 gallons. Uh, it, it empties itself down. So it's, so I, so it's not very strong. It's like, you know, a five to four to one, five to one ratio instead of full strength. Uh, but yeah, I, I do that. Now, if I do my, if I do my two gallon uh, watering can, um, I only put like, a tablespoon or maybe a little bit less of the miracle grows in there. I don't, I don't feed full strength. Um, I don't, I don't think they need the full strength because I feed them routinely. 
Okay. Um, and then a question about the, uh, the soap. What would the purpose of the liquid soap be? Um, I'm trying to remember what, what he said. Um, in one case, he talked about the fact that it helps wash off the leaves, but there was another, uh, oh, one of the other things that it apparently does, and it helps to soften the soil. You know, and, and again, I, you know, I, I, I just use, I just use what he, what he, what he's done. I mean, it, you know, you see some of the other things he's got tea and whiskey guarantee success. I mean, you know, um, yeah. I, I use, I use some of this stuff and, and, uh, it, it seems to have worked for me over the years, both in the ground and in the pots. And how often do you spray the irises? Normally I spray once a month and I even spray during the winter. Of course, you know, when you get up real cold, you're not gonna do that. But normally when, it, when the, the ground's soft enough to uh, um, absorb moisture and stuff, I spray once a month. Yeah, okay. Um, I also, I also add around um, uh, Jim Hedgecock sells um, a fertilizer blend of 62424, I think it is. And basically, I get that from him and I sprinkle a tablespoon of that around my clumps of iris. Uh, I do that twice a year. Okay. So that would In be your high, some of your Pardon? high phosphate. That would be a part of your high phosphate fertilizer. Yeah. With, yeah. With Twice yeah, a year. low nitrogen, um, okay. but I sprinkle that around uh, once in the spring and once in the fall. Um, but I, this, this other stuff, I, I do that once a month. And how about the last question here is how about the ammonia in? Um... I, never, I never use the ammonia. Um, I've kind of adapted this. I have used a fish emulsion uh, at times, uh, but I kind of got away from that. Fish emulsion kind of stinks. <laughs> So I, I've kind of gotten away from that. I, I pretty much stick with the can of beer, the dishwashing soap, the instant iced tea, and the miracle Grows. And I, like I said, I rotate the three different miracle Grows. Now, miracle Grow has come out with a couple of new ones that, um, that are, they don't, they don't tend to dissolve as well as the older ones. Um, I can't remember what, what, what they are, but they're, they're a newer, uh, mix or whatever, <clears throat> but they don't they don't dissolve as well in the in the cup sprayer. Okay, and do you ever use worm castings? No, I have never used worm castings, but I um, I like having worms in the garden. Um, I will tell you that my experience with um, um, getting, getting rid of grubs with Grubex. Um, in Virginia, I used Grubex one time on my front lawn to get rid of grubs. And when it rained, I used to get worms coming up out of the soil all the time. Um, and then all of a sudden, I wasn't getting worms coming up all the time. Happened to have been after I used the Grubex. So I don't, I'm, I'm very cautious about using something like that uh, just because I want, I want the worms in the soil for, for the natural castings. Okay. We good? Yep. Okay. Um, hardiness zones, uh, we talked about that. Um, this, is, this is what my backyard looked like one year and there was over on the retaining wall, which is over on the left and you can't see it. Okay, there was potted iris up there. Um, you know, I, I, I left them out year round again, like I, like I said here and like, uh, um, was it Chuck, I think said, uh, the Northern zones, you, you definitely need to treat them a little bit differently if you're going to get, um, some really, really hard, hard cold weather, uh, you need to treat them a little bit differently. Um, the pros. And again, we've talked about some of it. This is this is Iris Tectorum again. This one, uh, this is this is my front steps when we lived in Virginia. The front steps were on the south side of the house. This stayed out. This pot stayed out there year round. 
Um, and I got, always got nice flowers on it. Um, but it stayed out in the sun and stayed out in the rain and, you know, stayed out in the snow. Um, it just stayed right on the front steps. But anyway, um, containers can be relocated as desired. When I, when I first moved down here in, in, uh, in February, a couple of years ago, um, I, like I said, I brought 85 pot, 80, 85 pots with me, a potted iris. <clears throat> and because our house wasn't ready, we were renting, but I had iris blooming. So what I did is when I had, and, and of course we all know that iris don't all bloom at the same time. You know, they, they spread across, you know, a number of weeks. So as, as the different iris bloomed in pots, I would take the pots out in the front flower bed and I would set them out there so that people could enjoy them. And I take the other ones that had finished blooming and I put them back in the, in the back. So you can, you can relocate them for a number of different reasons, just to show, you know, just for show, or, or if you need to move them for some reason, you can move them. Um, they definitely provide additional garden space. Um, I, I, even even here, I don't have my flower beds finished yet. I've got a second flower bed uh, that I need to put in, so I still have iris in pots because I just don't have the space. And I still I still have two hundred iris in the ground in the flower beds around the house, plus the sixty five that are in that other bed. Um, so I've still got thirty or so iris in pots around. Um, the containers definitely will control the the increases or spread, maybe not necessarily the increases, but it will definitely control the spread. Uh, and it will, it will confine and, and congest, if you will, um, the iris rhizomes as, as you get increases. So it'll get, it'll get crowded. Um, and you'll, you'll see some of that in a little bit. Um, you, can, you can focus disease and pest control uh, in a in a container um, a little bit better uh, if you if you need to do that, but again I've I've not experienced a lot of problems like that where I needed to do that. Um, containers if you're just looking for a temporary healing in um, place, you know, put put some some halfway decent soil in a pot and throw the throw the rhizomes in the pot and and uh, you know. Maybe a, a, you know a month or so later, you got your flower bed ready or whatever, permanent location. Take them out, and the nice thing about having them in a pot is the the, the roots are growing. Okay, you don't <clears throat> you don't have to basically take the dirt off the off the roots. Just pull it out of the pot, dirt and all, and put it in the ground, and it'll just continue to grow. You you won't have that stunting. Um, again. Container iris make stunning plantings in the landscape, um, especially when they're in bloom. Um, they're great, great way to trade and share and, and give as gifts. Um, and they can be exhibited. Um, let's see here. Yeah, you can locate them anywhere. And you've already seen these pictures here. You know, I've got them located in different spots. There's one here. There's another one there. There's another one here. You got one here. This is a little, this is a little tree for one gallon pots that I, I came across and I said, oh, I got to have that. So I bought that and I keep iris in there and I've had iris bloom in that. Um, and expanding your garden space. Again, there's, there's 20 plus iris in these pots. Uh, and that's a lot of garden space. Uh, when you when you think about it, uh, but you know, look at it and look at look at how nice they're they're blooming. Um, and a lot of these are historics, by the way. I've got a historic collection that starts at the 1600s and stops. My historic collection stops in 1950. That was when I was born. Uh, but I I buy um, modern iris. I buy iris every year, new introductions every year. But I I keep keep the historics. That's that's kind of, I like that old fashioned form, uh, but you can definitely increase your garden space. And you see some of these, you know, this, this one right here, this green one over here on the left, 
Uh, that one's got a that one's got a reservoir on it. Okay, these don't. Um, that red one down there does. Um, now, the Kanza containers, they need watering. You need to water them routinely, especially if they're in in you know good full sun. Um, they do they do need good feeding because the 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 roots are restricted. And, and um, you know, the, the, it, it, with the rains and stuff like that, it just kind of flushes through. So they do need, you know, kind of routine feeding. I mean, not every day, but like I said, you know, um, more, more than that. Um, they need to be divided sooner. Uh, they will definitely bust out of the pots. You can see that they, the, now these guys have been in here a while uh, uh, and, and I should have moved these but they will definitely bust their way out of pots. Um, and the roots, you see there's some more that are busting. Look at how crowded that one is. That's a historic, that's Lady Bing. Um, but these are, these are all really crowded busting out. You can see the roots, the roots, you'll find when you, when you take them out of the pots, pull them out, that the roots will be all along the side like this. Just like, just like when you get, you know, pansies or anything like that from a, from a nursery that you're planting, you'll find that you got a lot of roots along the outside of the pot. Um, but, uh, and the roots, well, this is, this is a Siberian here, okay? Um, this one here, I don't know. Uh, this one here has got some roots going through it also in the bottom coming out, okay? So if you... If you have these sitting on the ground, which most of mine are, uh, when you go to pull them up, you may have to pull them up because the roots have basically escaped down through and they're starting to grow into the, into the ground. Um, and oh, by the way, weeds love pots. They're gonna grow into pots just as well Maybe even better, especially if you're feeding them, than they will than they will in your garden. Um, so you're not going to get away with uh, without weeding. Um, sorry about that. Okay, uh, there's a couple comments and questions. Uh, sure. Howie, Howie says containers are particularly good for Louisiana irises. And uh, then a question, um, what is the best time of the year to transplant iris from a garden to pots? And a comment after that, someone says, I've done it all four seasons. Um, I would, uh, personally, I, I would uh, qualify that. Um, there's no digging for me here in the middle of the winter because the ground is frozen. So yep. I, I can't dig and put uh, plants into a pot. So it depends on where you are, I think, for that. Uh, that answer. Um, the, the best time probably is when you would routinely normally um, dig and, and split and, and replant iris um, normally in that in that late summer fall period. And of course, you know, like like a lot of them, I mean, uh, you're you're pushing it, Gary, but even in Virginia, we would push it if you if you waited till like later November or whatever, if you started getting frost, the frost uh, even though we didn't have a, a deep frost line, you would get a frost heave and it would push those rhizomes out. Yeah. So you've you got to pay attention to, to what your environment is. Um, then a couple of other questions. One is how do you keep the squirrels out? That's a... <laughs> you got a BB gun? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Topic <laughs> there to, um, I, I, I have not had a problem with squirrels and iris. Um, I had a lot of squirrels in Virginia um, in the backyard, but I, I never had a problem with squirrels, but I know some people do. And, and I, I'm, not sh I'm not sure why I didn't. Um, down here, we've had a few squirrels around, uh, but, but um, they, don't, they don't seem to bother it. I got some rabbits that eat everything under the sun, but they don't eat my iris. Uh, for me, my, my biggest problem with squirrels is if it's a, a container that I've recently potted up, so it's fairly fresh soil and it's in the fall and they're trying to plant 
acorns or walnuts <laughs> yeah. or whatever. And so they will dig the soil out and put their own, and sometimes throw a rhizome out and they'll put their, their um, acorn or whatever in. So <laughs> that's been my biggest problem with squirrels, but. Um, I've had a couple of those where, yeah, they've, they've gotten into a fresh pot. They, see, they seem to like the fresh ones better than the other ones. And they seem to, to dig in, and like you said, they'll every now and then they'll kick a, a rhizome out and plant their acorn. But uh, um, other than that, I've, I've not had any, any real problems yeah. with squirrels. Uh, what do you put in the bottom of your nursery pots to keep the soil from leaking out? Nothing. I don't, I, I put the soil from bottom to top. Okay. Um, it will, it will come out. And that's part of the reason why the soil will settle over time is some of that does come out. Um, but it settles more than the amount of soil that comes out. I mean, just, just natural. Even, even if you press that down good as you're, as you're adding layers of soil into the pot, okay, um, it's still going to settle over time. But I don't, I don't put anything. I know uh, some people put, you know, rocks or broken pieces of clay pots or whatever in the bottom. Um, I mine is soil from bottom to top. And somebody mentions they use coffee filters. Um, so uh, there's a question. Can you please talk a little more about growing Siberians in pots? I've, I've had pretty decent luck with growing Siberians in pots. Um, you, the Siberians will, will tend to that one, that one Siberian. I mean, they, they, <clears throat> they tend to uh, um, get thick if you leave them in there for a few years, just like a Siberian will anyway. But I've, I've had pretty decent luck doing, doing basically the same things that I do with with the bearded and the other iris, um, treating them all the same way. Um, I, they, they grow really well and flower really well. Um, I, I don't do anything special for Siberians. For Louisianas, I, I do. I, I water them a little bit more than I, than I do the bearded. Um, and, and I mean, they, they, they obviously don't mind that, uh, but uh, and the Siberians will take take a little bit more water too, but <clears throat> I don't really do much different with them. Okay, um, and here's a question. That I think maybe uh, I don't know. It says, do pre-emergent herbicides harm iris? Uh, do you use any pre-emergent type thing in your pots? I don't use any pre-emergents in the pots. Um, I have used Surfland um in the garden um the, my, my experience with that is um i have and i've i have heard this from a hybridizer that um be careful with that around seedlings um but uh, around you know established iris i've i've used surf land <clears throat> and one of the things that i have, have kind of found is it works really great but if you don't continually use it, um, as most of us know, uh, seeds will hang in there for years and then finally germinate. So if you're not continually using it or, or you disturb the soil around where you're treated, um, the weeds will come back. Okay. And uh, what size pots do you recommend for standard dwarf beardeds? Um, I... If you, if you really want a nice, um, a nice show for standard dwarf bearded, I would, I would go with something um, between the two and the three gallon. Um, down, down, you know, three gallon is a common size. One gallon is a common size. Trying to get something in between is kind of tough. But the three gallon, I mean, over over a few years, if you if you if you treat it just like you treat your garden and know that in three years you're going to have a nice clump, okay, <clears throat> um, a three gallon will give you a nice show. Um, it really will. A three gallon, in in some ways, is is almost on the edge of being too small for 
tall beardeds. Um, but they will grow really well in, in, a, in a three gallon pot. <clears throat> the ones that I showed you on the, the ones that were on the um, on the back um, uh, retaining wall of my pool, those are primarily historics. And a lot of those were from the um, late 1800s, early 1900s. And we all know that during that period, the iris were smaller. So they really, you know, really grew more like an intermediate than, than a tall. Uh, so they grew well in those pots. Um, you can, you could put a standard dwarf in a, in a one gallon pot. Um, probably the, after the second year, you're probably going to need to remove it. Uh, miniature dwarfs do good in a one gallon pot. They, they'll make a nice, but, but you know, those, the, the dwarfs, the standard dwarfs and the miniature dwarfs, they spread really well too. So, you know, th they'll do good in a three gallon. Okay. Um, and then uh, back a ways, there was a question about, uh, I think, which I think you touched on initially, when you're initially planting in a container, how many do you plant and all the same kind or multiple types? And it sounds like it's more a personal preference, hardly. Um, it depends if it like, if I'm, if I'm looking for a clump and I'm using a bigger pot, um, I'll, I'll lean towards the triangle and plant three with the toes in, the fans out. And then two or three years down the road, I'm gonna have a nice clump. Uh, I have that first, that first slide, second slide, uh, I guess it was, um, you saw that orange pot and it had what, 12 or so iris rhizomes in it. Um, I did that specifically because I rescued some historics from a farm um, and the lady knew what they were, but she didn't know which ones were which. So I just planted them all in that pot to establish them. And I knew that that was the group of historics from that farm. And then I could, I could as, as they bloomed or whatever, I could pick out what they were. But um, in, in, in the, one, the one gallon pots, if I put a tall beard in that, I'm just going to put one rhizome in it. Um, and, and, you know, you'll end up with, you know, increases out of that with that, you know, without any problems. But um, some of it's kind of, of, of hit and miss. You saw, you saw that, that Louisiana in that gray pot. Uh, that's a pretty good sized pot. Um, there was, um, initially, I think there was three rhizomes that I planted in that of Ico Ico. Um, and that, that pot was, I think that was like the third year on that pot. So it was just a nice clump. I mean, it was really, really a nice clump of iris in there. Um, and that's, and that's one of the things you got to do is, is think, think further out. Um, you know, don't, don't worry about the first year. When I, when I talk to garden clubs, I tell them, look, you know, whatever you plant, don't count on any more than 50% bloom the first year. Okay. And uh, I think we have somebody with a hand up. I don't know if they're still there. Would you like to unmute yourself and ask? Thanks, Thanks Gary. It's Benita, Mass Teller. Um, Hi, Benita. Hey, Doug. Um, I have a really weird question for you. We got a weird I, answer. I Seven. noticed when I saw your pots at the pool during the last conference that was there, the first thing I thought was, how does he do it? And I never did remember to ask you. My 300 plus pots have a couple of years back attracted snakes. And it, they don't hurt the irises, but they are of a venomous variety. So they also distract the gardener to the point that the irises never got weeded again and now they died because there were so many weeds but is there has anybody else grown a lot of containers and had them 
literally attract the snakes. I don't know if it was me watering the pots and, you know, the cooler moisture there attracted the snakes or whatever. But I had a plethora of baby copperheads. Hmm. I, I have never had a, a snake problem in, in, uh, in Virginia. I had, um, I had black snakes in the yard. Uh, of course, a black snake will normally, you know, get after the poisonous snakes anyway. Um, but I've, I've never had them around the iris pots. Um, I don't know. Oh, I don't know if it was something in the soil that was attracting them, uh, okay. but um, yeah, I, especially venomous ones. I that that they scare me. I can tolerate. Well, that's the black generally snakes, the problem because I yeah. quit taking care of over a lot of pots that I had a lot of investment in. Yeah, and wanted to cross and. Yeah, know. I don't. I don't know. I mean, the only thing that I could tell you is is. Um, you know, try putting some snake away or something like that uh, yeah. around that area where you have them. Yeah. And, and okay. see if see if that'll uh, um, ward them off a little bit, hold them off a little bit. Um, well, I just was wondering because my I have a pool about the same size as yours and my pool also attracts snakes, but huh. usually not the venomous ones. Yeah, no, the, the, you'll get snakes in the pool. I, I, I was, you know, would pull them out of the skimmer every now and then, you know, and, yeah. and normally it was, I, although I did have a couple of big black snakes in there, but normally it's the smaller non-poisonous ones that, that yeah. fall in there and can't get back out again. Well, those I like because they go after the voles, but yeah, yeah, I run the, okay, thanks. I just wondered. Okay. Sorry. If there I was can't anything I didn't know about. Thank you. Mm hmm. Okay. Last but not least here. Um, exhibiting container grown iris. Now for um, for everyone. Um, and, and I don't I don't know if everyone saw the links or, or went to the links that uh, were included in the announcement for the for the uh, um, webinar here. <clears throat> but one of the links was to the um, new um, container iris section in the judge's handbook. And you can, you can now um, bring container iris to, to a show. And that, that section talks about bringing container iris to the show. Um, again, um, They'll be judged for cultural perfection and conditioning and grooming. If you read through that, it'll tell you all this. The container should be proportional to the iris. The bloom stock should stand freely without support. Um, but one thing to keep in mind is this, that the container grown iris are not eligible for best specimen of show, but they will be eligible for, for all the other awards at a show. Um, some things that, that came to mind as I was going through some of this. Uh, first of all, um, you probably won't get very many containers at shows for the next year or two because number one, it's, it's brand new. Um, so people haven't had a chance to be growing iris in containers and have them be mature enough to bring to a show. Um, the second thing is, is uh, for those of you that are um, thinking about adding that to your show program, and it, and it should be in your show program, um, keep some things in mind. Um, the, the show chair, <clears throat> um, kind of remind your folks that not, not to water their containers before the show, uh, because if they do, you're going to get water all over the place. Um, keep in mind that if you, if you have a container um, and you set it down and it's got drainage holes in it, um, when you pick it back up, there's probably going to be dirt wherever you set it back down. Maybe not a lot, but a little bit. So it may be something where you have to um, put some plastic down 
in the area, whether it be a small bench or a table or wherever, where you're going to be displaying uh, the container grown iris at the show. Um, keep in mind that, that um, bring iris to the show in pots that you can handle. Don't, don't bring a big pot, you know, bring pots that, are, that you can handle. And, and I would expect that over the next few years, people might be experimenting with this a little bit more uh, so that they can bring container iris to the show and kind of get a feel for, you know, how, ma how many years you might have to have a iris grown in a particular size container to get it show worthy. Of course, the other thing too is, is that it's just like iris for your, from your garden that you're bringing to the show. You may think you're going to bring iris XYZ to the show, but unfortunately it's in a pot and, it, and it's not ready to bloom or it's already finished blooming. So, but there's, you know, there's certain things. The other thing too is um, it talks about in the judge's handbook that if you're growing iris in the black plastic pots, <clears throat> put, put that pot in another pot um, and, and kind of hide it, if you will, with some, some sort of topping or whatever um, so that it, you know, you know d d basically don't show it in a black plastic nursery pot. Uh, you don't have to get a fancy pot. There's no reason to have a real fancy pot, but, but uh, don't show it in a black plastic pot. Um, your pots aren't, aren't necessarily judged, but obviously, you know, have a pot that, that you know, looks nice. It, you're not being judged on the pot, but have a pot that looks nice and, and fits the size of the iris. Um, that's, that's pretty much, uh, I don't know if anybody else is, again, this, this container, exhibiting container grown iris is, is a new thing. Um, it'll take probably some, some growing pains and stuff like that over the next few years as, as iris societies, um, you know, take a look at, at um, adding container grown iris to their shows. Uh, but, um, you know, I, I definitely wanted to bring that up because it, it is new and, and if you're growing container iris to start off with, anyway, uh, you very well may have something that, that you know, you want to you wanna exhibit. With that, Gary, I'm, Andy, I'm, I'm pretty much done. I, any other questions? I'd, I'd be more than happy to entertain. Uh, just uh, a couple things. One is I, I would just like to uh, tell everybody that um, uh, you should be getting your uh, iris bulletin in the mail uh, within a week or so. And on the cover is uh, the, the photo contest was featured in this issue of the bulletin. And um, on the cover of irises is an iris uh, that uh, uh, a photo that Kathy Oldham took and it was a container grown iris. So that's pretty appropriate. Um, a gorgeous iris. Yeah, gorgeous. very nice. Um, the other, uh, one other question here about Louisiana irises from Eileen Hollander says, I grow Louisiana irises in the ground in three gallon pots with holes in mixing tubs in three gallon pots with holes in baby pools and in three gallon pots in larger pots with no holes. Has anyone studied soil chemistry with irises after living in the pot for three years to determine nutrient loading? No, but yeah, it's interesting. Um, one of the one of the ladies that, that used to be in the Fredericksburg area Iris Society um, used to grow Louisiana's in pots in tubs, um, and they did really well. But I I. I didn't follow how she, that was kind of before I really got into growing iris in pots. Um, I, don't, I don't grow mine that way, um, but she always had gorgeous Louisianas in, the, in, in uh, her tubs. She would have, you know, multiple pots in a, in a, in a little tub um, and they always were, were great. I don't, I don't know how quickly the soil depletes really in, in that environment though. Okay. 
Okay, I think we're, um, uh, that's a nice program and it, this will be um, um, added to the AIS YouTube channel and will be available um, in a few days uh, if you want to rewatch it or if someone uh, that you know missed it, they can go there and watch it. So if, if, those, for those of you who have not seen it, here's the picture of the uh, on the cover that is coming up and that you should get soon. And um, it's in fact, um, 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 PC and I is a Pacific Coast native iris and uh, it's grown in a pot. And Kathy, Kathy, are you still here? You can tell us more about it. With that framework. And if not, yes, that's okay. Yes, I'm still here. Okay. Um, it's hybridized by Joe Gio, who's in Santa Cruz, California. And the name of it's Wedding Proposal. And uh, yeah, it's, I probably had it. I mean, it's not ideal maybe, but it was in a four inch pot. <laughs> And sometimes they can be a little picky, and we we get pretty. I live a little bit inland. I'm not on the coast like Joe Gio is, so I have to move them into the shade or whatever whenever we have our heat spells in the summertime. So, um, yeah, that it's it's a very subtle color, and I just think it's um, I really like it. I he's got so many beautiful uh, Pacific Coast natives. He's hybridized, but that one tended to be. Um, pretty nice last year. It had nice reflected light on the ruffled edges. And you won the photo contest with that picture. So congratulations. Thank yes. you very yes. much. Yeah, awesome, our, That's fantastic. This is Doug again. Are, are a lot of the Pacific Coast iris, I'm not familiar with them being on the East Coast, are a lot of them, um, do, do they grow well in pots also? I think they do. Um, I mean, iris are supposed to be pretty um, easy to grow, but quite honestly, I I think all of us who grow iris, we tend to go towards the ones that are finicky. <laughs> <laughs> and because I'm inland and it's so hot in the summertime these past, I don't know, five or 10 years, I think, um, I mean, I move them around a lot, but I know people who live in more, we'll call it misty coastal areas and they, plant them underneath pine trees or, you know, in, you know, they do just fine. They're planted in the ground and bloom quite well for them. But hmm. there, there are always those varieties that you, that don't really, I mean, you might get a bloom out of them, but that's it. That's, yeah. You, know, you got to start again. <laughs> we have a couple of hands up, uh, Gary. Oh, uh, Ross. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, just want to say hi to Doug again. We miss hey, you Ross, up here in Virginia. Doing? Good to see you. Um, great program. I enjoyed Thank it you. and stuff. Just want to do a physical clap for you. I know everybody been thanking you and stuff. But um, yeah, it was a good program. I learned a lot. And are, a couple you, refreshers are you growing too. any in pots, Ross? Um, Louisiana's just because okay. I had to repot up discarded rhizomes and they pot up very easily. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think I have like. 27 pots of Louisiana's out there and they were just the discarded broken off old rhizomes and you just put them in under two inches of soil and yeah. it's like day lilies yeah wait and they'll come back up and that's they a, all come back up so it's, it, that's a good that's a good point I mean if you've yeah. got if you've got some smaller rhizomes yeah uh, and you really you you really don't want to throw them away mm. um stick them in a pot they'll grow yeah. You know? Give them to friends as presents, you know? Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah, for me, I considered a potting operation for my little business, and I yeah. had all these old rhizomes. I replanted the green ones with the on it, and the ones that had nothing on it, not even roots, I put them in the pots under the ground, and for Louisiana's, they all came back up with oh, multiple yeah. increases. So for Louisiana's, I can speak well. They do pot up very nicely yeah. and very you easily. Can yeah. You can have a bald rhizome put it in the ground and it's going to grow. Yeah. Yeah. Even if you drop it on your, on your lawn, it'll grow eventually. You'll be like, where'd that come <laughs> from? So anyways, I just want to say hi and thank you for the program. So, okay. Thanks, Ross. Good seeing mm -hmm. you.